Uh, we're going to start now on today's talk. <coughs> uh, yesterday morning, I was giving a description of uh, the journey of meditation and the landmarks on that journey, what we call, for want of a better word, the stages of meditation. And I have to reinforce the idea that these aren't stages you aspire to, you will never get these through your effort, you get these for staying where you are and uh, observing the mind go in in its natural, uh, in a natural way, go in, 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 deeper into the stages of the meditation. <coughs> but there's also another um, description of the path of meditation which I wanted to focus on this morning, uh, which is more uh, not on the objects of the meditation which we experience from time to time, but more the emotions which arise in this path of meditation. And I have uh, sometimes emphasized to people the path of meditation is not an intellectual exercise, it's much more an emotional exercise where we learn to skillfully deal and use our emotions uh, in order to arouse those which are very powerful and to let go of those which are uh, obstacles to us. It is uh, an emotional journey for us. And any of you who have been in the very deep meditations know how powerful those emotions can be and how uh, equally strong emotions such as fear can obstruct you. So it is learning how to deal with those emotions. And at the risk of sounding sexist, uh, just from anecdotal evidence of all the years which I have been teaching meditation, it does seem to be that women have an easier time to get into jhana. And some of you say, yeah, and others say, that's terrible. <laughs> but it seems that way, but it doesn't matter because when it comes to the insights which are based on those jhanas, the men seem to sort of catch up and get the insights quicker than the women. So it all evens out in the end. But I always was wondering why it is that it seemed to be more women repeat success in meditation, the jhanas, than men do. And it may be that just that ability to allow very strong emotions to be with them and to actually guide them is something which men haven't learned to do as much. And an example of that, which I told a few people during their interviews, there comes times in this meditation retreat when one starts crying. And sometimes wonder why. And it's not one person, it's many people. I'm not looking at you, I'm not thinking I'm talking about me again. No, it's many people. And my, the most wonderful story was a year or two ago, this Australian man, who was maybe late 40s, early 50s, uh, came to this retreat and he went to the interview and then he said that for no reason at all he started crying and you know, it was really sort of an obstacle for him. And when I sort of discussed the matter with him, one of the things I asked, when was the last time you cried? And he said, well, I was about seven or eight. Because then my father, he was an Australian man, my father said, boys don't cry, especially in Australia, they'll toughen up. And so this young man, a now middle-aged man, hadn't cried for about 40 years. And so now he had learned how to let go of all these controllings and just allow himself to be. He had a lot of crying to catch up <laughs> and so. He was crying and crying and crying for days until the end of the retreat. I asked him, how were you? He said, oh, I feel great, having got all that crying out of me. So it was one of those uh, uh, signs that sometimes that we need to allow those emotions just to come up, to understand them, to let them go. And then we become very easy to actually to get into a nice meditation. And it's the same with learning how to actually feel your way into meditation rather than think your way. Even you now modern women are just too intellectual and they just think too much rather than feel you know, the truth of life through emotions rather than through ideas and concepts. And this comes up with a sequence which you find again and again taught by the Buddha. This is you know, in the sutras. 
you know, where he starts from several different starting places, and I'm going to start with uh, one of those places, but it all goes on to the same sequence just after the first or second stage. And this particular one was when you get inspiration. Somebody says something, or you see something, and it inspires you. And, or you actually contemplate some dhamma, and you get a little bit of insight, and it inspires you. Now, inspiration is an emotion, a very positive um, emotion, which can be uh, developed. You know, you allow yourself to get inspired. And I mentioned yesterday, just by all the people who come to feed you, all the volunteers who look after you, all the teachers who teach you, and all of the friends who support you just by being in the cottage and trying their best to be quiet and supportive of you. And it becomes inspiring. Now it's very easy to be cynical and say, ah, oh, yeah, I know, but they do this because of that and that. But no, just allow yourself to be inspired. And when you allow inspiration to come up, it creates a huge boost of energy. It's one of the reasons why when I talk, I don't try and talk just um, facts, but try and talk from the heart to give some sort of inspiration for people. And when you do give inspiration, you get a quick boost of energy, and it's a very positive energy, and a very, very uh, strong increase in happiness. Now there's many ways to develop that inspiration, and one way is a, a classic way that people, especially if you're a traditional Buddhist, you reflect on the qualities of the Buddha, or the Dhamma, or the Sangha, or if you know the beauty of kindness and generosity. And I mentioned yesterday, you could contemplate on the floor which you sit on in this part of the hall. You know, it was monks who were just sacrificing everything to make sure this place was here in time for everybody. And sometimes you get very inspired that way. If I feel a bit dull or depressed, I remember some of the teachings and examples of my teacher, Rajan Shah. I remember some of the great acts of generosity and kindness which, which I have seen in my life as a monk. And somebody was asking me yesterday because uh, they were wondering about how um, the nuns' monastery started. They thought it was land given by some rich person to start the nuns' monastery. But these are inspiring little stories, and I'll share that one with you if you haven't heard it already. You know, having sort of built a nice monk's monastery, you know, I realized, like other people did, that where are the nuns? Where's the women in Buddhism? Is Buddhism another sort of sexist, misogynistic religion which uh, suppresses uh, the ability for women to practice to the very highest? Is that the case? And uh, instead of just arguing about it, I've seen many, many scholars, m read many books, but don't just write about it, do something about it. So with a few people we started a little uh, fund for Nuns Monastery Building Fund. That's how you start things. And you know, it's really hopeless trying to collect money for something which is just an idea. So what happened was maybe 5,000 here, 10,000, well, you know, <coughs> dollar here, a dollar there, and the money got up very, very, very slowly. And it was like we are getting nowhere. And just, you know, when we'll get a Nuns Monastery, maybe in the 22nd century, but certainly not the 21st century. And then this one day, just uh, somebody said that there was a, an Australian man wanted to make a donation to the nuns monastery. And it was just not an idea, it was a bank account, that's all it was, of about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars 20000 in. And so I met the fellow in front of the kitchen at Bodhinyana. He came in jeans and a sort of thongs and a singlet, you know, in an old car. And uh, he came up to me and said that uh, his wife had just given birth. He had his first daughter. He said he was a Buddhist, a Western Buddhist. He said, I've had my first child and I want to do something to celebrate the birth of my first child. And I'm a Buddhist. I, I doubt if she will ever want to become uh, a Buddhist nun. But if she does, I want her to have the chance. And he wrote out a check for $250,000. <laughs> And I remember, even I was shaking with 250,000. 
I better not drop this or put it away somewhere. Where did I leave it? I don't know. It's amazing when you've got a check like that, you know, you're very mindful of it. <laughs> My glasses sometimes I leave and I can't find them, but a quarter of a million dollar check. And that was quite a long time ago. And that's how these things actually started. And I say that because it's inspirational. You know, they just came out of the blue from nowhere. It seems as if that, you know, when you do something which is really worthwhile, forces which, you know, you can't really know, you can't tell, they come to assist you and help you. And it's inspirational to know that such goodness and kindness and generosity exists in this world. And so I have all these stories which I remember like that. And when I remember those stories, I get this big boost of happiness. Sloth and torpor disappear, energy arises, and you get this quality in the mind called pity. From, uh, sorry, no, first of all, so there's another quality, first of all, called pomoja. Pomoja is this like uplift of happiness, energy, and joy in the mind. It's sometimes called like delight. It's you know, a sense of happiness. But it's a beautiful source of happiness, not the happiness you get when it's ah, such a delicious meal. Oh, that was a really, really good movie. It's a very beautiful and pure emotion. And if you use your mindfulness on the emotions, you will be able to sense that some emotions are very positive are very helpful to the path of meditation and also to insight and they should never be taken for granted. They should be cherished like a $250,000 check. When they come to you, you're not going to lose this. And that sort of inspiration when it comes, please cherish it and keep it there. And you can arouse those inspirations in so many different ways. There's some of the teachings which I heard from my teacher. Wow, those are incredible. There's sometimes that, you know, it's you're in the right position, the right mind space, and somebody says something and whack, that really sort of gets right into you. And you remember those times, and you remember just the kindness and the generosity and the beauty of some of the uh, experiences, the spiritual experiences of your life, and straight away you're uplifted. And it gives you this quality of like pramuja, this joy, this brightness of the mind. Now if that doesn't work, there is a meditation technique which I developed. I use it on myself first of all, I'm experiment. I've been meditating a long time. And so the things which work for me I share with others and I get feedback back. If it doesn't work for others I stop teaching it. But this one I've shared with others and it works very well. And so I'm sharing it with you again now. So in order to get up that joy and that inspiration, sometimes what I do, and I encourage you to do, is you sit down at the beginning of the meditation, you close your eyes, and you start imagining the most peaceful, profound experience you've ever had in your whole life. It doesn't have to be when you were meditating. Uh, one of the experiences I remember, you know, which I used, was even when I was a school child maybe about 13 or 14, it was a half-day holiday from school. And you know, I was smart enough that uh, my homework wasn't that big a chore, but I had lots of it to do, so at lunchtime I went in the library and finished all my homework off. So after lunch, when I walked out of school for that half-day holiday, I remember walking out saying, I have nothing I need to do. I have no homework to do, no appointments, no lessons to, to go to. I have this beautiful sense of absolute freedom, of having nothing which I need to do. No pressure on me, no deadlines, nothing which I, I have to perform in a certain time. And even then I remember that was such a happy little moment absolutely 100% stress-free. I could just go wherever I wanted, whichever way I wanted, and I remember that sense of freedom. Later on in monastic life, I had uh, a period uh, just after my fifth year as a monk where 
or our monks were supposed to go on this charaka, this two dog, just walking on the roads of Thailand with hardly any possessions. And that I remember also with inspiration. Sometimes I do that recollection. I sit down, close my eyes, I remember that time when all that I owned I carried on my back and there was not much at all. You know, many of you have seen me when I travel just take a bag, just one small monk's bag. And I have great fun going through the airports of the world. Sir, you've forgotten your suitcases. And I say, I do not have any suitcases. This is all I have. But how can you live with such a small amount of things when everyone else is lucky in these big heavy suitcases? And I tell them, you know, I'm a monk. And you know, it's amazing just how many customs officials throughout the world, they see that and they say, yeah, well done. It's nice to see a real monk every now and again, because some of the other monks, they come with all sorts of baggage and stuff. And I just have a small little bag, which many of you have seen. And this particular time was even better, because you were walking along the streets, uh, along the roads in Thailand, in the northeast, in the north. And he just had very, very small possessions. And wherever you got to that night, you know, you put up your mosquito net, you slept in the fields, in the forests, by the rivers, anywhere would do. And in the morning you go with your arms bowl and into the nearest village and get your meal. Not a worry in the world. You knew you'd always have a place to stay, you'd always have food to eat, and you could go wherever you wanted. Every crossroad you had another choice, left, right, straight ahead, or turn around. And you had no compulsion to do anything. It was a total sense of freedom. If ever you want to know what a bird feels like, that's what a bird feels like. Go wherever you want, whenever you want. Beautiful sense of freedom. So what I do when I start meditating, I sit down, close my eyes, and I remember those feelings, those emotions of being totally unconstrained, no pressure on at all. I remember those. And straight away this beautiful feeling of pramuja, this joy, this happiness comes up. And then I go into my meditation. I start by developing a beautiful emotion. Otherwise you can start meditating, oh God, another hour, when's, when's lunch coming? Now, if you develop that sort of emotion at the beginning of the meditation, of course your meditation is not going to work at all. You know, if you start with that type of emotion, you're going to be in big trouble. So you develop a beautiful state of mind to begin with. And from that beautiful state of mind of Pamuja, it's so easy to, to develop a deeper meditation. So, I'm not quite sure you may have been in some sort of resort, in some exotic place in the world, and you can imagine yourself just sitting on the beach, you know, no mobile phone access, no internet. You're just sitting there, nothing to do with a nice, um, a nice uh, glass of coconut juice next to you, and just nice and warm, not too sort of cold and not too hot. No sort of family around because when you go overseas and family, that's more stress. Just you or just your partner, and totally free with nothing to do all day, no cricket to listen on the radio, nothing to do, total absence of any compulsion. And th there were times like that you felt so content, so at peace with yourself and the whole world. Now I'm sure that everyone has had memories like that, some many, some very few, but you all had something like that. And so you recall that memory as you start your meditation. And when you recall it, sometimes you need to reinforce it before it starts to work. So I ask people when I do this little meditation, don't just remember the time, fill in all the details. What time of the day was it? You know, exactly what hour was it? You know, what season was it? Was it cold season, hot season, December, July? What season was it? And what was around you? What was the sky like? Was it sort of clear or was it cloudy? You know, were there other people around? What trees were around? Because once you start to fill in the details of the most peaceful and wonderful experience you can recall, you are reinforcing the peace, the stillness, the sense of contentment. Every time you fill in details, the contentment is being 
strengthened. And you can do that for about five minutes, really get into it and indulge in it until the, you know, you've built up this picture, this memory, you are using the past and this time it's a good thing to do. Built up this wonderful picture of this incredible time, maybe years ago you felt so peaceful, so happy, so content. Nothing was missing, there was hardly any suffering left, you know, it's just so nice. And after five minutes then you go and do something like watch your breath. And it is the easiest thing in the world to do. So because you've got an emotional foundation. So as the Buddha was saying, once you start to get this inspiration and this pramuja, this joy coming up, the next thing is this piti comes up from the pramuja. These are natural developments. The piti gives a deeper sense of happiness. I always, uh, always remark on just how difficult it is to get English translations for these terms. It's like there are so many different words in Pali for pleasure and we've only got one in English. It's because the Buddhist monks really got so into the different types of pleasure in the human mind. There's a different name for each one. Just because the Eskimos, you know, the Inuits live up in the north in the snowfields, they say they've got so many different words for snow. Whereas Westerners, because we don't live there, we don't know it very well, it's just snow. And because Buddhist monks and nuns have spent so much time in the pleasures of their mind, they've got a different word for every type of pleasure. And because other people don't know that, they've only got one word. And these are all these different words. You look in the Pali and there's just another word for pleasure. And this is this, this pity which comes up which is more like, ex not exciting, but more enthusiastic. It comes with some energy, it comes with an opportunity to, to put more power into the mindfulness. And when that energy sort of comes up, it's another type of emotion. You are now starting to meditate happily. And it's emotion which starts to develop now starting from inspiration, starting from this sense of joy into this pity. This is often where uh, in the Buddhist text they say that sometimes when you have pity so the body can start to shake, this is where you sometimes have tears of joy. Uh, you feel so happy and sometimes you're just crying out of joy and happiness. It's that type of energy in the mind. And sometimes people thought that that would create too much disturbance for the mind. But if it is the right type of pity, the next thing which happens, and one of the reasons I like to emphasize this little process, is you get bodily and mental tranquility. The body becomes still. And when I first started looking at this sequence in the Buddhist text, I thought, that's how you sit still not through force or through control, but because of joy and happiness. That is the cause of having a body which is perfectly still. You can try and control the body through force and hold it still, just like one of those uh, uh, household guards of Buckingham Palace who have to stand still <laughs> while everybody takes photographs at them and pokes them and tries to <laughs> anything they possibly can to make them move. I mean, they're highly trained to be still like that, but that's through control. But if you look at sometimes uh, people meditating, they're so incredibly still, there's no control there at all, they're totally relaxed. But they're not moving. And so bodily tranquility coming from this sense of joy and pity, that is how you can sit for long <coughs> periods of time. Uh, some of thy anecdotes, I recall Again, just at the end of my little wandering period, I went to a monastery in the north of Thailand and I travelled all day in a very cramped bus. Now these were seats which were maybe just big enough for one tiny person and they, they stuck three people in there. And it was really, really cramped and I was so sore after about five or six hours in this very hot bus. And you know, it was in the afternoon and I was just tired, sore, sweaty. And I got to this monastery about four, uh, five o'clock and they said, oh great, you're just in time. 
oh no, we're going to start meditating at six for four hours. I thought, oh God, four hours? I'm tired, I just had enough time to have a shower and then go to meditate. And there's a strict monastery, you know, four hours, so that's it, you have to sit down no matter what, can't move. And I thought, what am I going to do? And I knew straight away, you have to get your body still pretty quickly. Because if you get in there quickly, it's very easy to meditate for four hours with no problem at all. But if you don't get in there quickly, if you don't know how to tranquilize your body, your body's going to be aching and sore and restless and it'll be a great torture for four hours. In fact, sometimes when they force people to sit that long, uh, it's called, what's it, prolonged stress position. It's one of the forms of torture they do at Guantanamo Bay. And they do that on meditation retreats as well. If people heard about that, <laughs> some Buddhist societies <laughs> will be hauled up to the Human Rights Commission in The Hague. But, in this one, it just, okay, no messing around, sit down and start to get some joy coming up. As soon as I got joy coming up, rather than negativity, oh, why do I have to do this? This is not fair, I've been travelling all day, I'm tired, I need a more... Instead of getting negative, you get this beautiful happiness coming up. And as soon as the happiness comes up, the body feels so free and so light, and you can meditate easily. In fact, I was very upset, because they rang the bell a quarter of an hour early. We only did three hours and three quarters, instead of the four hours. Where's my other quarter hour gone? You're having a good time. Well, this is what happens. If you want to get bodily tranquility, don't force it. Yes, I mean, get some nice cushions and like, sit on a chair or whatever, but to really get your body still, develop happiness inside the body. When it's happy there, the aches and pains vanish and you can sit perfectly still for a long time. It's from this emotion of pity you get tranquility, which is another emotion. Sometimes people think that tranquility is just some physical state. No, it's an emotion in the body of peace, physical peace. And if you want to know what emotion feels like, you know, when you're sort of relaxed, maybe after you've been meditating a long time, you go to your bed and you lay out and relax. That is a joyful feeling. Stretch out, oh, now I can rest my back, rest my knees, and my butt, and you can really stretch out. There's a joy there. Please notice that emotion of a relaxed body. But once you start to notice that and get the joy come up, your body relaxes even deeper. You heard me say this in the last couple of days. Why is it that when I sit down and meditate and I watch the physical body and I relax it as much as I can, until I feel the delight in the body, the happiness of a relaxed body, I can perceive that. And as soon as I perceive it, it goes deeper. It takes me into deeper relaxation. It is the joy which creates the tranquility. And so that once I focus on that joy, I don't have to focus on the tranquility, I focus on the cause of the tranquility. When you focus on that joy, then the body becomes very, very peaceful. And it just sits there happily for a long period of time. And it does not disturb you. The problem with saliva doesn't come up. The problem with itches and aches and pains do not come up. Again, it's a really strange thing. It doesn't seem to be logical. But if you get into tranquility of the body, you can sit for many hours. But when you come out afterwards, it's not an ache or a pain. If you don't get into that tranquility, even half an hour, there's an ache or there's, there's an, uh, a pain there. You may see just after the evening talk, uh, the question and answers when I go, go, oh, there's always a bit of a, an oi there when I get up because I haven't been meditating, I've been talking with you. And my body gets very stiff. But if I can sit here for a long time, get into tranquility, there's no oi's and oh, when I get up. In fact, as many of the Thai people here know, in the northeast of Thailand, uh, old men are called, you know, poor means Mr. Poor Oi. And old women are called Mare. Mare means mum, like mother, like auntie. Oi. Poor Oi. And Mare Oi. And the reason is, and this is absolutely true, is because when old people move and get up, <laughs> they always go Oi. 
Oh. <laughs> and that becomes their name. <laughs> like Mr. Groan and Mrs. Groan, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but if you have like uh, some uh, tranquility caused by joy, you don't have that. And it's a wonderful thing to experience. So, if you want to be able to sit long periods of time, don't worry about force. Try and develop a sense of happiness inside of yourself, especially the joy of relaxation. And you will find the body will relax even further, and the aches and pains, and also things like saliva, itchy noses, they will not come up for you. And once you have that tranquility of the body, the next thing which happens is another emotion which develops, which is another form of pleasure, sukha. You, know, you have these, these uh, cause and effect relationships, and this particular one, inspiration leads to this joy, pamuja. Pamuja leads to pity, I just call it enthusiastic joy, and that leads to the tranquility of the body, and also the mind gets tranquil too. And that leads to sukha. And this word sukha, you can probably best describe it as bliss. If you're just so happy, it's a peaceful bliss. If you can take your concept of peace and add the concept of bliss and mix it all together, then that may be what sukha is. Just you know, the happiness of peace. Maybe you go out at night and there's no one else around and, and it's not rainy like last night, but you know, the stars are out, it's very peaceful, very serene, and that's a very, very beautiful joy. And that type of peace, that sort of happiness, not just peace being boring, but peace being vibrant and really happy, this is nice. That type of happiness is actually comes from the tranquility of the body. It's like the body is not disturbing me anymore. I'm free of that sort of pain and suffering. And because I don't have to do anything, it's the energy going into the, the mind. It's the thing which accompanies strong mindfulness. Sati, the mindfulness, and sukha, the joy, they go together. And once that starts to build up, now you can experience and get to know this sukha, this happiness, it gets very strong. And if there's any fear which comes up in meditation or fear and excitement which comes up, it's usually the power of the joy which is what really worries you because it starts to get very strong. And of course it feels like it's getting out of control. And it's supposed to go out of control. That's the whole point of this, not controlling it, let it go. Let it run. Give it its freedom, give it its legs, let it just run your happiness and bliss and joy. Because when you stop, start controlling it, you always mess up the power of meditation. When you let go and just again be the passenger, then it works. Often trying to give you other similes on how to let go when the meditation starts to really take off. The simile which I've given people is, uh, imagine you're driving in the car on a fast road in heavy traffic and then, you know, I tell you, so I'm in your passenger seat, and I tell you, take your hands off the steering wheel, take your feet off the pedals, in the big heavy traffic, let go. Not many people would do that, thank goodness. <laughs> it's only a metaphor, but in meditation you have to do it. And I remember last uh, retreat I gave, when was that? Um, maybe last uh, Easter, I suppose. I could have been in the Buddhist Fellowship Retreat uh, in October. The one lady, she said she dreamt of that. She dreamt that she was in this car, and I was in the passenger seat. She was driving it, and it was going to this cliff, and she wanted to pull on the brakes. And I said, no. <laughs> Take your hand off the steering wheel, feet off the pedals, just let go but we're hurting towards the cliff, let go. And she did it, she let go. And so we hurtled over the cliff, and as we hurtled over the cliff, she saw at the bottom of the cliff there was a road, but it had this really sharp right turn. And she wanted to actually to grab onto the steering wheel again so she could make the right turn. I said, no, hands off the steering wheel, just let go. And together we hurtled down this cliff really, really fast. When we hit the bottom, 
and had this really hairpin right turn and the car turned right all by itself. And we went across this road perfectly safe and I smiled at her. Told you so. <laughs> and that dream was an incredible, really wonderful dream because you know, she had a little bit of faith in the dream state you know, to actually to follow my instructions, to go down the cliff, and even though it was the right turn and the bottom, the car did it by itself. She understood the teaching of meditation. You get very scared sometimes. I've got to do something, otherwise it's going to go, I'm going to crash, I'm going to explode, I'm going to go crazy. No, hands off the steering wheel, feet off the pedal. Ajahn Brahm is here, you'll be fine. And if you actually do that, it's incredible just the deep states of meditation you get because a lot of times when we do have strong emotions, we try and control them. Whether it's crying, we want to stop it because we think it's not allowed. Even in meditation you feel like laughing sometimes, please laugh. Don't control it. And sometimes it's like that. It's almost people do that in the meditation hall, they suddenly burst out laughing. You're not crazy, it's just something which happens. It's a type of pity sometimes comes up. Or, you know, or just you get incredible joy, let it come, stop controlling it, take your hands off the steering wheel. This is where we become skillful in using our emotions. Until those emotions get incredibly strong. Yeah, you see these beautiful lights, but that's not the most important part of the, the nimitta, just the, the light and just the colours and the brilliance of it. It's the associated bliss which is there with the the limiters, that is the most important and it's because people don't know how to deal with that is why they can't get into the jhanas. They're afraid, they control the bliss rather than just letting it be and letting it develop, being still with incredible high emotions. And if you can learn how to deal with the emotions, especially the positive ones, the powerful ones, and just let the bliss be and allow yourself to go over the cliff you're perfectly safe. In fact, you've never been as safe before in your whole life. And then you can attain these jhanas. Sometimes people say, isn't it dangerous though? Because in the jhana you've heard me say that you can't feel the body, you can't hear anything. You know, what happens if someone tries to kill me or there's an accident or whatever? And I like telling all these great stories of people who do get into jhanas <laughs> and are perfectly safe. Nothing ever happens to them. The story in the sutras was of this monk. He was in jhanas in the middle of the jungle and a couple of village men were collecting mushrooms or wood or something in the jungle and they came across this monk sitting perfectly still. And they thought, oh God, he's dead. The monk's died. Because it's very hard to tell the difference between a monk in jhana and a dead monk. So they thought, oh, what should we do? They thought, oh well, you know, we can't, we can't just leave him here and get eaten by the animals. Well, that's not respectful. No, we're Buddhists. So they said, okay, we're in the jungle, there's lots of wood around, let's collect some wood, make a funeral pyre and put the venerable on top. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they did. It only took them a few minutes, there's wood all over the place in the jungle. And then they, with the monk on the top, they, they knew some sort of chanting, whatever they could you know, think up, just like you. You know, if you had to do some chanting, a Buddhist funeral or something, you'd think something to do. And as they did a bit of chanting, whatever they knew, lit the fire. And once the fire was lit, you know, they had stuff to do. They couldn't hang around all day. So off they went, collecting their mushrooms, whatever they were doing, you know, having cremated the monk. So they thought. They saw the flames and everything, so they thought, you know, he's, gonna, he's gone. And the next morning, this is in the sutras, they were really surprised and very impressed when the monk came on arms round in their village. Not even his robe was charred. Everything was perfect. And they thought, wow, we just cremated you yesterday. <laughs> so you thought. <laughs> so based on that story, you know, if you do get into a jhana and we do make a mistake and we send you over to the funeral parlour and we do the ceremony and we put you in the oven to cremate you, and it would be a great experience because after, you know, the, when the oven cools down, when they open the oven to sort of you know, get the ashes, hi, it's me again. <laughs> <laughs> you'll still be alive. <laughs> it doesn't destroy you. Now you think that is just a myth. 
But there was uh, one monk, a very powerful Indonesian monk. I like telling his story because I would not tell this story when he was alive, but he died recently, so I don't mind telling this. Because you know, when you say about sort of you know, psychic powers or you know who's the arahat, who's enlightened, who's not, we don't usually tell that when people are alive. But usually on a person's deathbed, it's okay to say you know what you've been doing, what you can do, what you can't do. And it's also once they're, they're dead, because there's no pride left then, because they can't receive any, any adulation, because they're dead now. So we usually tell people when they're dead, uh, you know, what they were doing. And it's also sometimes when people ask me, Achan Brahm, okay, what stage are you at? You know, are you enlightened? Have you got any psychic powers? And of course, you can ask me that till uh, uh, I will never answer you. But there is a trick, the loophole. And the loophole is, Try and convince me I'm about to die. You know, get some concoction, you know, from the chemist or somebody, and you give it to me, and I think, oh, and get a doctor to come and say, Ajahn Brahm, you're about to die. And then, then you can ask me, and I'll say, because that's our tradition. You always ask a person on the deathbed, you know, what they've been doing. And then I'll say, oh, you know, this is what I've been doing, this is what we've been doing. Say, ha, 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 you're not really dead, this is just the fake. Now we've got it out of you, now we know the truth. <laughs> The next time I really die, and the doctor comes up and says, I don't believe you, it's that <laughs> trick <laughs> which I told you, I'm not saying. But anyway, this guy, he was a really great meditator, and I remember talking to him. He was the guy, there was uh, this, uh, was a, she was a, a Mormon law, uh, her name was Nuni. She was actually in a little movie, The Princess, The Monk and the Forest. BBC did one in the north of Thailand some years ago. But she was, she went to go to a meditation class in Wat Bawan in central Thailand with this monk, Sudama his name was. And she said the weirdest thing ever happened. She said she was meditating there and she thought something's really weird, something's going on here. So she opened her eyes and she couldn't believe what she saw. There was rays of light coming out of this monk's eyes into another meditator. Now, real rays of light like you see in the movies. Sort of like, I don't know what you call it, like, um, what was a Superman? I when I used to like Superman, yeah, like rays of light coming out, X-ray eyes coming out right into another person, and she freaked out because you know this was real. She was actually seeing this from this monk, and that monk did have some psychic powers. And where he got his powers from was he was a layman, and he went off into the jungles of Java. This was 40 years ago when there's still jungles in Java instead of uh, concrete jungles, and he went over there to meditate to be like a one of these rishis, these, these um, sages. They still have that very strong tradition in Java of people going off into the jungle and just becoming crazy sometimes, but sometimes getting some deep meditation. He said, we're sitting down there. I remember how he described it to me. He said, we saw like this star coming right towards him. And he said, like, he, he married, he united with that star. And that's typical Nimitta experiences. And there's beautiful light in his mind. And he just merges right into it. He said, didn't know how long he was in there. He called it like married to, the, to an angel. That's just you know, the, the metaphor, just united with this incredible bliss. You know, and when he came out, he noticed the, uh, the jungle had changed. It was not the same as when he went in. And so he asked the villagers what had happened. And there had been a flood, a very heavy storm, and he'd been under a couple of meters of water for about five or six days. And you could see the damage in all the trees around it. But it doesn't matter, five or six days underwater, you know, he's in jhanas, no trouble at all. So remember that, if there's a tsunami coming, get into jhana quickly, <laughs> and you'll be perfectly safe. It's a big bushfire, get into jhana, and all the trees will be burned, but afterwards you'll be fine. Or if there's a meteor heading to Earth, and this is the end of the world, get into Jhana, and then when the world ends, you'll still be there. But that won't be really good, no place to live. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm talking about. You become <laughs> invulnerable in these states, which is incredible to know, but that's actually true. That's what happens. So you don't have to be concerned at all. There's some sort of weird stuff happens in psychic stuff, that when you get into these states, you're perfectly invulnerable. Nothing can touch you. So that's why you don't have to worry at all. And these emotions are so strong that they take you into these deep states of meditation. 
And when you come out afterwards, I wanted to talk about this yesterday. Why? Is it just for having fun and blissing out like another type of, of uh, heroin or something, at the, the best drug ever, so you can just get high and have a good time? And of course it doesn't work like that because the Buddha was saying in this sequence of emotions, he was saying that you know, from this sukha, this, this happiness, the mind becomes still. From pity, the body becomes still. From this happiness, the mind becomes still. That is the cause of deep meditation. Sukhi no jitang samadhi yati. From this happiness, from sukha, the mind becomes still. I should pause there a little bit because if you haven't got happiness, in the meditation, you're not going to get into samadhi, you're not going to get still, you're not going to get jhanas. You've got to cultivate that happiness, cultivate that joy. And you can cultivate that all throughout this day, just like you cultivate mindfulness, you cultivate joy. You know, looking at things and smiling a lot. Last night people said, why aren't monks, or why aren't our meditators smiling? And indeed, that's a mistake you're making. You should put as much effort into your smiling throughout the day as you do being mindful if you want to get jhanas. <laughs> okay? So learn how to smile more. You know, look in the mirror, smile at one another, just smile at the little um, spiders in the webs, or whatever else is around there, smile more. When you develop that type of happiness, meditation actually takes off. And if you don't believe me, I always quote this sutra, Dhamma Chediya Sutta, Monuments to the Dhamma, Bhikkhu Bodhi translated it as, where the king went into the, j the Jeta grove to see the Buddha, I think I said this on the first night, kissed the Buddha's feet, and the Buddha said, why do you like coming in here so much? And that's where the king said, because the monks in this monastery, it was a monk's monastery, the monks in this monastery are always happy and are always smiling. And the Buddha said, yes, that is what you can expect of monks when they're practicing properly. When they're getting meditation success and also insights. They are smiling. So I can see how you're going on this retreat <laughs> by your smile. Okay, so please uh, inspire me by smiling some more during this retreat. It encourages other people and it's also enhancing your practice. From happiness the mind becomes still, not from being miserable. If you're miserable, you can forget about uh, getting into jhanas. You better go and cheer yourself up. Go into the room and do some kangaroo hopping, walking meditation. And that might sort of get you into jhanas afterwards. It gets you a sense of happiness. And if some of these monks, like living with Ajahn Shah, he was just a, he was a joker sometimes. And he, no, his, the person who took over from him was Ajahn Liam. He's now the abbot in Wat Ba Pong. And he was one of the toughest monks I've ever seen. You know, I mean, he was, could really enjoy anything. And except, one thing he could not enjoy was a joke from Ajahn Shah. Because it's imprinted into my brain, you know, when I saw him. You know, you know, ties are supposed to be very formal. And especially when you're monks, especially in front of your teacher, you know, sit up properly and just you know, be, be restrained. But this monk, Ajahn Liam, he was on his belly, holding his, crying his eyes out, rolling on the floor in front of Ajahn Shah. Was, Ajahn Shah had said something funny, and poor old Ajahn Liam, he couldn't resist it. He could resist uh, termites, sorry, not termites, mosquitoes, snakes, centipedes, heat and cold, lack of sleep, but he could. <laughs> He couldn't resist a joke from Ajahn Chah and he was rolling along the floor, laughing his head off. You see, just the happiness was something which was encouraged. The joy, the lightness. And that allowed the mind to get very still and get some great meditation. It's something which I learned. I remember when Ajahn Chah first went to the United States, he went to the, the IMS, you know, the International Meditation Society in Massachusetts. And I think the, the Burmese teachers had been there before. And in rolls Ajahn Chah with a big smile on his face. And they, I remember him telling me that uh, you know, experiences of going to the United States for the first time. And they said, you mean it's okay to smile? And yeah, of course, why not? 
We just had the Burmese teachers here. We thought we weren't allowed to. Oh, what a relief. <laughs> so they could smile again. Or even better, when I was in Hong Kong, and I, the first time I went to Hong Kong to teach over there and teach a retreat and teach some uh, talks and tell a few jokes. And after I went, there was this, uh, <laughs> this Chinese nun. She's come here on retreats before, uh, afterwards. But she came up and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ajahn Brah. I said, what, what have I done? Have I taught you Dhamma or got your meditation going? No. Before you came, I was not allowed to smile in Hong Kong. I was a Mahayana nun, and Mahayanans are not allowed to smile. Now after you, I can smile. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's so cute, you know. She's a human being, you know, she likes to smile and laugh, but when lay people around, okay, no smiling. <laughs> that happiness is important. It's an emotion which we develop, because without it, the jhanas are blocked. Sukhino, chitang samadhyati, from happiness the mind gets very still. And then afterwards, when you emerge from samadhi, what happens next? The next in this causal sequence is seeing things as they truly are. Just like these are causal effects. You know, one thing causes another, which causes another. When you get sort of very happy, the mind becomes very still. When you get very still, then you get insight. You see things as they truly are. And I think I mentioned to you yesterday, one of the great teachings of the Buddha is that you don't have to decide, oh, I will now develop insight. Oh, I will now see things as they truly are. Because the Buddha said it happens automatically. You can't avoid it. One whose mind is still, especially in the jhanas, will see things as they truly are. It's right in front of you. You can't miss it. Stillness. And what do we mean by that? If you, number one, if you've emerged from a deep meditation, number one, these things called the five hindrances are totally gone. For days sometimes, you don't have sloth and torpor. The mind isn't restless, you've got so much energy, it's so poised. You can just go and look at anything. You look at a clock and just, wow, look at that. It's amazing. So sometimes you see people after meditation, sometimes outside the hall here, they're just looking at a flower for about an hour. <laughs> they're not crazy, they just they haven't finished with it yet. They're just enjoying it. They've got so much, so lack of restlessness, they can stay with things. And uh, no, it's obviously just no sloth on top of the really a powerfully awake, really strong mindfulness. And the nicest thing about this is they've got no desires after they meditated, which means they do not bend the truth to fit themselves. A lot of times the reason why we don't get insight is because of desire. We don't see what's there, we see what we want to see. And anything which challenges us, especially challenges us to the core, challenges our root beliefs, we will be in denial, we will not see it because of ill will. Those first two hindrances are what bend the truth to suit us. And it's only when those two hindrances are gone, it doesn't matter what we see, we're just going to accept it as truth. We're not going to bend anything because all our desires, our ill will, all our wishful thinking and denial are subdued. That's the only time you can really trust your insights after jhana, when the hindrances are gone. As the Buddha said, it's the hindrances which stop wisdom and stop calm. They to bend wisdom. So, what you actually see, you can actually trust. And the way I describe it, in simile, is like the simile of the lake. I mentioned this in passing, but here I emphasize it even more. When the lake has a wave on the surface, it distorts the truth. You can't see it very clearly. If you try looking at the stars at night in the lake when it's, uh, there's waves on the surface, you can't see anything. But there comes a time when the lake is perfectly still. 
not even a ripple on the surface. And people describe it as smooth as a mirror, because that's what it looks like. When the lake is perfectly still, and not a movement at all, then and only then do you have a perfect, accurate reflection of the truth of things as they really are. You can see the moon and the stars and the forest around it perfectly. And that's an accurate simile for how stillness is the cause for seeing things as they truly are. That's where you get your insights from. What type of insights do you get? Straight away, the insight into the meaning of happiness. One of the most important things which people need to know in your pursuit of happiness, what really is happiness? What on earth have you been pursuing all this life? And all this stuff you thought was going to make you happy, has it? You know, even health, money, house, relationships. Or has it just led you to another pursuit? It's like chasing, like a dog chasing its tail. Can see the tail, can almost sn sniff it, but can never quite reach it. Or like the, uh, the donkey chasing the carrot. Sometimes that's what life is like. You haven't really reached happiness. You don't know what happiness is. It's really, for me as a monk, it's really weird why people say, what did you become a monk for? You know, I had a good degree, I could have got a good job, become rich, get a nice girl. You know, you could, you know, if you've got a good degree, that's actually quite attractive to women because you know, you've got a nice income coming in. So, why didn't you do that? You know, why did you sacrifice all your, your happiness? You know, is being a monk this ascetic? You know, do you whip yourselves and just deny yourselves? And you can actually see that I'm a very happy monk. And I did, I became a monk, I stay a monk, for the pursuit of pleasure. <laughs> I am a pleasure-loving monk. <laughs> and sometimes saying such things is like confronting, because you say, what do you mean? Monks don't have pleasure. You know, and if you do have pleasure, you're a bad monk. <laughs> not that type of pleasure, not sexual pleasure, not sort of sensual pleasure about meditation pleasure. And you really get to be like, like people go into sort of this, uh, uh, into food and they become gourmets, they become, they go to all the great restaurants and they, and they really, really um, develop the, their palates so they can really taste the very finest of food. Now that's with food, like monks like that with meditation. You just go to the best meditation restaurants. You know, there's only four of them, first, second, third and fourth jhanas. You can taste all oh, this different type of pleasure. Mm. This is, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going back there again. You become a connoisseur of pleasure. And this is what you do when you first get into these deep meditations. They blow you apart, that such pleasure could exist. And you know, for me, the first time, this pleasure exists and no one's told me about this before? I was actually quite angry in the sense that why weren't people letting, letting, letting on that these pleasures exist for human beings? Because I didn't know much about Buddhism at the time. So first of all, you get some insight into what pleasure is, what happiness is. And all your pursuits of pleasure in other places is not important anymore. Because you have the pleasure of peacefulness, of stillness. And it also means you realize that all this coming and going all this agitation, all this hard work you do in life, is it really necessary? Why are we making such a mess of this world? Because we're just seeking pleasure you know, from material resources. We could leave it alone and be even happier. You don't need to have big houses. You don't need to have big cars. You don't need to have a different outfit for every, every event you go to. You can live so much more simply. Why don't you? It's because it's not encouraged, because we're looking for pleasure out there in the world, rather than inside of ourselves. So actually you learn a lot about cravings and attachments when you experience real happiness. And you also you realize just how it arises. It always arises when you stop wanting things if you don't have to go out and get happiness. You don't have to buy it in a shop. 
You don't have to work hard for it. You just stop and there it is there for you. And this actually shows you just a different way of living in this world. Not chasing things, just sitting still and enjoying what you already have. At the very least, it means, you know, the person you have committed to in marriage, you can be much more, commi much more content with them. You know, when you want things, the person you live with is never good enough. There's always another better model, sort of in the office or, you know, somewhere else. <laughs> and it never ends. So when you have this beautiful sense of gratitude and peace, not wanting, because when you start wanting things, you miss what you already have. And so many people, because they want something more, they're continually going all over the world, never being still, never having any rest, always going on to the next thing. You ever notice that, you know, people ask you, where are you going? You're always going somewhere. Going on to the next thing, going on to the next event, going on to the next retreat, going on to the next meditation, going on to the next meal. Very rarely do we actually stop and be here. We always got the plans of where we're going to next. And where we're going to next is what consumes our mind and our energy and our life. Always on the move. And you find out that when you meditate, you learn how to stop. And it's beautiful stopping. And after a while, why, why was I searching for so much when I had so much right here? Why do I want all this stuff? I've got more than enough here. More happiness, more bliss than I could, than I could ever want when I stopped wanting things. This teaches you four noble truths. This is the first teaching of the Buddha. You know, there is suffering, and suffering comes from wanting. Such a clear teaching. But you don't know how to stop wanting, at least not stop wanting long enough to actually to check those teachings out. And when you do do that, and you find out the Buddha was absolutely correct, you stop wanting, just for a few hours don't want anything. You're so content, you're blissed out. You realize, why am I happy? Because a lot of suffering has gone. Huge amount of suffering. It's the suffering of wanting stuff. And people think that that's, that's fun. It's not fun, it's torture. If I had a hell, my hell, I've mentioned this earlier, my hell would be a shopping mall. The hell of craving of wanting stuff. And everyone who went to my hell of a shopping mall, I'd give a, a gold platinum credit card with no credit limit. You can get as much as you want whenever you want it. To me that would be hell. <laughs> but some people think, wow, I mean I can go shopping for whatever I want and I've got no limit on my credit card. Yeah, that's bliss. That's not, that's hell. <laughs> because your wanting is being encouraged and there's no peace. There's no freedom at all. And the other thing which I kept on mentioning, oh crikey, I'm going overboard. The freedom. You know, so many people just say they want to be free in life. We have revolutions for, to be free. We live in the free world. We want more freedoms. Do you ever feel free? We've always got all these burdens and responsibilities and things you have to do and just, you never really feel free. Hopefully you'll notice, whenever you meditate deeply, that's something you can notice. Freedom. You feel free, you get to know what this word means. And whenever you feel free, you'll notice this because there's no desires or cravings bothering you. There's no place you have to be, there's nothing you need, there's nothing you have to get. There's no place you have to be, there's nothing you have to attain, there's nothing you have to change. Please be free in this retreat. Six days, is it six days, five days have gone past already? If you haven't attained it yet, you won't. Give up. You're hopeless. <laughs> you think you're going to get jhana? No way. Enlightenment? Absolutely not. So give up. You're hopeless. You're not going to get anything. You mean I don't have to try and get jhanas now? No, you won't get them, okay, believe me. I'm free! I can just enjoy meditation, I, I'm not, I'm not going to get anything. No way. 
Ajahn Brahm said, so you can meditate now and enjoy yourself. Now you'll get jhanas. <laughs> That's how it works, for goodness sake. So be free. Can you actually feel that emotion of freedom and just what it's like? I don't have to attain something. All my life I've been told I'm not good enough, I have to get something more. Now I'm told I'm not enlightened, I have to get enlightened. And now I'm told my meditation is no good, I've got to get jhanas. Oh, this is... <laughs> Isn't it nice? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it incredibly liberating to feel you don't have to do anything? You can be content right now with whatever you've got. Totally abandoned all craving. 100%. And of course, just jars, woof, light but woof. It just comes to you immediately, almost, if you can do that. So this is what freedom is, a freedom from desires. What a wonderful insight that is, seeing what real freedom is. Now remember, these insights aren't ideas, they're not intellects, it's not something you write down and publish a book about it. Remember, the books I write are mostly joke books and funny story books. I deliberately try to avoid um, deep dhamma, because <laughs> people don't understand it anyway. But they say, sometimes they say they do. This is one of the things that I've been to many talks by other monks, and I ask people afterwards, what do you reckon of that? And said, Oh, that was, uh, that was so profound. I didn't understand it, <laughs> but it was very profound. <laughs> and I go to my talks where I explain everything nice and easy, so do you understand? Yeah, I understand that. I understood it, but it can't be deep. <laughs> you can't win. But anyway, freedom, what does it feel like? So after deep meditations, understand the emotion of freedom. Not an idea, not a thought, but an emotion, a feeling of freedom. When you get to understand that, you understand real freedom, true freedom, is where you're content. There's no desires, there's no craving. You are understanding the Four Noble Truths. That craving is what causes you to be in prison, causes suffering, letting go of craving. You're out of prison, you're out of jail, you're free. That feels so brilliant, so beautiful. Follow that. That is one of those streams which leads to Nibbana, out of the mist. The emotion of freedom. The emotion of, of happiness, tranquility. Those are the emotions. And today's talk was learning about those emotions as a path of meditation. Not just have I got to stage one yet, present moment awareness? Silence, breath, whole breath, beautiful breath, uh, nimittas, stabilizing the nimittas, first jhanas. How about changing that whole process to developing the emotions? Have you got this inspiration come up yet? Have you got to stage one, inspiration? Have you got to stage two, just this joy? Have you got to stage three, pity? This enthusiastic happiness, so you like cry. Have you got to stage four, the tranquility of the body? You're so happy you can sit here for hours. Have you got to stage five, the, the peaceful joy, the sukha? And have you got to get stage six, the jhanas? Have you got to stage seven, insight? It happens naturally, not insight as a thought, insight as an emotion. You, Feel freedom, you know it, you're inside of it. You're in bliss, you're in liberation, rather than just thinking about it. So, the seven stages of the emotional path. Is it seven stages? I can't forget now. Six or seven, whatever. Stages of the emotional path of meditation. So give that a try. Sadhu, Sadhu. If I stretch too much on the second, I've got nowhere else to go. <laughs> okay, have a great meditate today. <laughs>